So uh, I'm going to talk about the LA Air Force Base uh, vehicle to grid demonstration. Uh, it's already been mentioned a couple of times. It's uh, one of the biggest vehicle to grid demonstrations in existence now, and in fact is only a pilot for a much larger effort on the part of the uh, US Defense Department. So I'm going to start with a little bit of background on our own work, and particularly the development of this software, Distributed Energy Resources Customer Adoption Model which is uh, the basis of what we're doing at the LA Air Force Base, but also in many other areas. Then uh, the project itself, make sure I fill, fulfill my obligations to Rachel here and cover the Air Force Base project. Uh, the goal there is to participate in the California ISO ancillary services market, and that's going to be the focus here. Show you a bit about the base and then talk about the complex technology that is needed to actually put into practice this very appealing but somewhat simplistic notion that if you have vehicles parked, then that's a resource that the ISO or the utility would like to take advantage of. And I'll show you a little bit of some of the early results that we're getting. If we have time, I've already been outed by uh, Pat Hoffman this morning as a, as a microgrids partisan, so I'm not going to let you down. And uh, one of my obligations uh, as a partisan is organizing an annual microgrids uh, a symposium. This year it's coming up in Santiago, Chile, and I'm hoping to encourage some of you to come. And uh, it's a very long trip, but we'd love to see you there. It's a, by invitation only, but since it is such a daunting trip, this is a very good year for you to get an invitation. So <laughs> see me afterwards if you're interested. If, you're, uh, if your company wants to sponsor, then I'm even more interested in uh, talking to you. Okay, so a little bit of background on the uh, Duracam concept. So basically, in, in any talk I give, I show this picture, so why should this one be uh, any different? What this shows is that over on the right-hand side, we've got certain kinds of energy services that we're trying to deliver, electricity, you know, cooling, etc. And that's true in, uh, particularly in commercial buildings, which has been our focus. And then over on the left, you can see supplies of commercial energy into buildings. And then uh, in the middle left, the opportunistic local fuels, solar, etc., that you'd like to take care of you'd like to take advantage of. So what Duracam is trying to do is to pick the best equipment to have in the gap between those two so that you can meet these service requirements on the right using these uh, opportunities over on the left, uh, either at minimum cost, car minimum carbon footprint, or very often some combination of the two. So there's two different parts here. One is picking the best equipment, and then the second is running it in real time. Uh, you can see up in the upper right that the interaction between buildings and vehicles is now becoming a, a, a particularly interesting area of research almost uh, uh, in its own right, and that's obviously where this uh, presentation is coming from, the role of electric vehicles up there in the top right corner. So just briefly, what's going into the software here? These service requirements, a lot of uh, economic environmental information, particularly tariffs, what kind of technologies are available, and then a lot of other variables like occupancy, weather, in the case of vehicles, what do you want to use the vehicles for? The uh, operational requirements of the vehicles are very important. And then coming out on the right-hand side, as I said, two key uh, outputs that we're interested in. One is what kind of equipment, and the other is how to operate it. So in this particular demonstration, we're down in the bottom right corner here with an electric vehicle fleet. The goal here is to figure out how to optimally operate the fleet at the LA Air Force Base. So a bit of an introduction to the projects and some of the key variables. Uh, DOD has already announced a, a wider project. Uh, this one at LA is the pilot, uh, including about 500 vehicles at six total bases, uh, LA being uh, the first. There's one other in California, which is China Lake. And they're very ambitious in trying to electrify a large part of this 200,000 uh, non-tactical vehicle fleet that DOD has uh, in the continental uh, US. These are mostly medium-duty uh, vehicles, and they're very little used, average about 7,000 miles a year. So uh, you'll see as we get into this that they're a particularly attractive kind of vehicle for participation into ancillary services markets because they're parked a large amount of the time, they have quite heavy, uh, large batteries, and they have quite high power, uh, both to charge and discharge. Um, about half of the fleet going in at LA, it's about 40 vehicles total, will probably have available to bid into the CAISO regulation up and regulation down markets. And currently we're scheduled to enter the market in uh, August 2013. 
There's many complexities in this project, and one of them is the funding sources. I will go into the details here. Uh, the two parts that, under which we're funding is ESTCP, which is a DOD <coughs> program, and we get quite a lot of funding also from the California Energy Commission. Basically, this is a two-year project. We're halfway into it. We're hoping to get the first vehicles in place in the middle of this year, and as I already mentioned, try to get into the market in August. How realistic is that? Well, I, you know, I'll let you be the judge here. Uh, the thing I want to emphasize is that DOD's objective here is primarily an economic objective. Even though there's a big technical challenge that we're into here, the key question they try, they're trying to answer at DOD is, does participation in these markets promise to deliver enough revenue to close the cost gap between a conventional fleet and a plug-in electric fleet? And most of what we're doing here is driven by that question rather than the technical questions although they, they, they are also formidable, as you'll see. So uh, this is a big picture architecture uh, drawing of uh, what we're trying to achieve. The blue box here shows what's on the base, and then the other parts are off the base. Over here on the left, you can see the vehicles plugged into their charging stations. In the middle right, the first thing that you need is some sort of software to control these vehicles. They're charging, they're discharging as well as their normal operations, that is, making sure they have a state of charge for the next trip they need to go on, making sure that the drivers have checked them out for their trip, you know where they're going, what their state of charge will be when you get back, and there's all kinds of complications here in trying to use the fleet for these two very different functions, one, their normal operations, and then secondly, participating in this very uh, rarefied ancillary services market. And uh, this particular function in this project is being provided by Bosch uh, Software Innovations. They're developing some software called eMobility. In the middle at the bottom, you can see us. We need to have a backroom system doing the optimization, choosing the bids, planning the scheduling, and everything. And then uh, down there in the middle at the bottom, you need to be able to communicate with the ISO. And there's two parties involved there. One is a QICOM, and the other is you need a scheduling coordinator which in our case is Southern California Edison, and then uh, Kaiso, of course. So uh, what are the ancillary services markets? We've heard a lot of talk about them this morning, but we need to get a bit more specific to understand exactly what we're trying to do at LA. So this load curve shows a, a busy but not frantic day at Kaiso, a peak load in the afternoon of about 38 gigawatts, about 50 is their all-time peak. And uh, over here on the right-hand side is what you'd normally think about if somebody said, uh, you know, reserves, ancillary services, you know, what does Kaiso need to have? This is the mental picture that most people would have. If you lost a big generating station, transmission line, or other resource, then you're going to have to have some reserve standing by that can come in and fill in the missing energy that you see in the picture here. Normally this is called operating uh, reserves. You need it to respond in a few minutes. Uh, normally these uh, emergencies don't last that long, but uh, ISO is going to ask you to commit to be able to provide that service for two hours if you bid into this market. So these kinds of resources are normally called operating reserves. These are not very attractive for vehicle applications because, number one, two hours is a long time to discharge a battery. That's quite a lot of energy. And we've got a very energy limited resource. And the energy limited nature of vehicles is even more extreme because we've got to make sure that we have enough charge in the vehicle for the next trip that it goes on. So you've got to be constantly watching that state of charge. You can't have it suddenly uh, discharged over a two hour period and then be useless when the CEO of the base comes to check it out. That would be a career ending mistake. So over here on the left hand side is what is much more interesting to us uh, in a V2G application. This is called regulation. So uh, through time, this was mentioned this morning uh, by Karen, through time there's going to be small deviations uh, in the balance between supply and demand. And uh, the, any ISO or any other, uh, um, any other balancing organization needs to make very fast adjustments to maintain the balance through time. As she mentioned this morning, it's a four second instruction in California, and actually that's fairly typical. So there's a tick. Uh, at uh, zero hours, an instruction goes out. At four seconds after midnight, you have to respond, and then four seconds after that, it's gotta be verified that you've responded. 
So this is a very different kind of service. You need very, very fast response, and vehicles and batteries in general are very good for that aspect. Um, the requirements are this four-second response. You've got to be available continuously. You want to be, you've got to be plugged in when you promise to be plugged in. Um, and uh, note that this is really a power market and not an energy market. You're making this capability available, but you're really not expecting to trade much energy. You're expecting that on balance, this is pretty much going to be zero. And that's exactly what you want for an electric vehicle application. As was also mentioned earlier this morning, the rules are still not that favorable. And as you can see here in the bottom left, if you're selling this service, Kaiso still wants you to be able to uh, provide it for an hour. Very unlikely that you'd ever do that in practice. And that's one of those rules that uh, may be a big barrier to look forward to uh, its elimination. So how much money is around here in this particular market? This shows you what the average price of regulation up was, monthly uh, median price uh, through three years of the market, the first three years that it was open. You can see it ranges about five to ten dollars most of the time. The average is actually nine dollars. But then there's some periods of pretty high prices. And uh, the dotted line at the top, the 90th percentile, shows you there's some really extreme prices once in a while. This is a very asymmetric price distribution. So there's an important lesson here that's relevant to these kind of vehicle applications. You want to be connected as much as possible. You don't want to miss these opportunities to clean up in the market. And in fact, the all-time high was about $550 in this market. So, uh, and you're bidding for hour-long periods. Notice that 2011 was really lucrative. And if you can understand why that is, you're a long way towards understanding what, what's going on in this market. It was mentioned a few times this morning that thermal generation is one of the big uh, competitors for providing regulation service. And that may be true, but in California, it tends to be much more hydro these days. In 2011, it was a very wet year, which means the reservoirs filled up, meaning that the owners of hydro weren't able to adjust their output very much. So sort of the competition there was driven out, the hydro competition, and thermal came onto the margin. So this shows you a little bit of what we, the world that we may be in if uh, it were thermal resources providing ancillary services. So uh, this is what the base looks like. It's just south of the LAX airport. And uh, in a uh, notable effort of the military to confuse people, they have north on the left side of this particular diagram. <laughs> so if you look in the upper uh, left corner, you can see this is just south of the LAX airport, which is over to our left here. If you've been out of, uh, in and out of LAX, I'm sure most of you have, you've been actually very close to here. You can actually walk to it from LAX, which is pretty notable in Southern California. Uh, looking at this aerial photograph, you'll see it's a bit of a disappointment. As bases go, this is uh, not much of a base. It doesn't have a runway. And in fact, you know, not much evidence of any battlements or, or anything else that you might expect. And in fact, the mission of this particular base is managing aerospace projects uh, with local contractors in this area. So over there in the, the left, you can see a, an area has been cleaned, the blue parking lot. That's where the vehicles will be. And uh, the very important building for us is this one down at the far left at the bottom, 285, which is where the... Um, vehicle dispatchers are, that's where we'll install our hardware, our control equipment, and our external communications. This is a bit more of what the base uh, looks like. It's a pretty new facility, about a five megawatt uh, peak load. Uh, this isn't a true microgrid demonstration, as I mentioned earlier, but there is some pretty good microgrid uh, potential here, and uh, you may be sure I have some proposals like that in the pipeline. It has about one uh, megawatt of installed PV on the base, including this particularly well done uh, uh, parking lot canopy structure. It's about 300 kilowatts, this one. And uh, here, that white building that you can see, the rather unexciting building, is uh, where the dispatchers are and where we'll install our equipment. One of the biggest problems that we've had in this project, and this is a warning to anybody trying to do something like this, is getting approval to install equipment on a base. Next time you see one of those headlines that come almost daily about DOD being worried about cybersecurity, think of the effect on me trying to install equipment, you know, a network uh, with external communications, and I'm going to allow this strange organization, the California ISO, that they've never heard of to control one of their vital resources. It's been one of our biggest difficulties. 
Um, so these three technologies that I mentioned, up in the top left, you need uh, equipment to, to manage the fleet. Uh, Bosch is providing that with its e-mobility solutions. There's two parts to it. One is you've got to do the normal fleet management, checking out vehicles, etc. The other is you've got to control the charging and discharging. And in this particular project, we are trying to discharge the vehicles. There was some confusion about this earlier in the day. You can actually uh, provide a kind of uh, reg up service uh, by just slowing down the rate of, char of charging of vehicles. And uh, the University of Delaware project was mentioned as an example of that. You can make much less money that way. And we'll get into that a little bit more in a moment. For our purposes, we really want to discharge these vehicles, and that's where most of the money comes from. The regulation up market is more lucrative than regulation down, and the more that you can discharge, the more you can participate in that reg up market. Top right, uh, coming to the communications part and the QACOM's contribution. Their background is in demand response. They uh, are installing a demand response automated server at a, uh, at a secure uh, location. The key point about the server is that it's inside the secure uh, CAISO system or ISO system, so it's a very secure resource. But downstream of it, between it and the base, with, uh, you can uh, use much less secure protocols, particularly open ADR in this case. And then ourselves down at the bottom, this is another project that we worked on at the Santa Rita Jail. This was one of the microgrid projects that Pat Hoffman's office funded that she mentioned this morning, and it was through this project that a lot of the algorithms for optimizing battery use were developed at Berkeley Lab. And that's a typical schedule here that you can see on the bottom right. So I show this just to emphasize that a lot of what we're trying to do here is just shift data around very quickly and respond very quickly and accurately. And I also show it because it's mesmerizing and it takes the sharp edge off some of the questions. So, <laughs> so over here on the far left, we've got these vehicles with batteries. They've got a great, a fantastic resource that everybody's very excited about providing to Kaiso over there on the right. And then it sounds like it's a simple business just to turn over control of these vehicles to Kaiso, as, and in fact, it's enormously complicated to set up these structures. And I won't go through this in detail, but sort of what we're sending out is what kind of resource do we have, how much are we bidding into the market tomorrow, all that kind of information. Uh, and then coming back from Kaiso, you've got these instructions that we've got to respond to in four seconds. And you've got all these institutions and all these mechanisms in between. The vehicles need to speak to Bosch, they need to get instructions from us. The bids and everything else and the instructions coming back have to get to a QACOM. And Kaiso won't speak to any ordinary member of the public. You've got to have a scheduling coordinator in there as well. So uh, this is a few example results that I'll show you. This is an example fleet, 18 vehicles, and these three types of vehicles are ones with pretty good vehicle-to-grid uh, potential. The first ones we're likely to have at the base are Nissan Leafs here on the left side. Uh, these auto port vans are ones that uh, were developed uh, as part of that University of De Delaware study. And then these Smith vehicles are ones that are uh, very typical of what the DOD is looking for longer term with its bigger fleet, and they're being used uh, at another at a demonstration at another base, Fort Carson in Colorado. Look down here. Look down here at the bottom left, and you can see with these vehicles how much energy we have available, how much power we have available, uh, both charging and discharging. And in the bottom right, you can see the minimums that Kaiso wants for you to participate in their market. So hitting that 500 kilowatt minimum is looking pretty tough right now. You've got to have a 500 kilowatt resource. You've got to demonstrate, as I said, to be certified that you can charge or discharge for a full hour at that rate. Pretty tough. Uh, the minimum bid at any point in time, 100 kilowatts, and then increments of 10 kilowatts. Um, this is a schedule for this fleet, uh, this fictitious fleet. Well, fictitious, but it's probably somewhat realistic what we will ultimately have at the base, based on past usage of vehicles at the base. You'll notice, as I said, most of the time they're parked. The colored areas are where their vehicles are being used, and the intensity of the color shows you how much energy they use on the trip. So the redder colors mean that more, there was a bigger difference in the state of charge when, we, when they came back, uh, based on our estimates. So these are what outputs from uh, our optimization might look like. The blue line here is at the top, 
through a typical day, this is a summer day, the blue line shows the reg up prices, they're higher, right? Important lesson, reg up prices are higher. If they're high in the afternoon, you really want to have your vehicles available and participate in the afternoon if you can. But of course, look at the time the vehicles are used in the afternoon. Uh, so managing them carefully in the afternoons is important. Reg down, the opposite, uh, that uh, prices are higher at night. The picture below shows the amount of energy that we have available. And uh, you have to, in your bid, not only say how much capacity you have, you have to submit also part of your bid uh, total energy. And that's what the dotted red and uh, blue lines are. The dotted line in the middle is the state of charge. So notice that the optimization keeps the state of charge of the vehicles pretty stable during the day. It does not change much. And uh, the gap between the dotted line and either the colored lines basically show, tells you how much power you have to bid into the market. So here at the bottom, you can see the amounts that actually got bid here. And uh, the 540, you can see reg up uh, more lucrative. And you're trying to bid that 540 into the reg up market as much as you can until vehicles start to be checked out in the middle of the day. You can't meet that requirement anymore. Note just that one point here, and this is the only detail I'm going to burden you with here, that it goes above 540 here. Why? Up here you can see that you do charge the vehicles a little bit. The state of charge goes up just before you get into this busy period. So this means you're changing your charging rate to bid into the market. And that's the only example in this particular case. We're actually changing the charging rate. And down here at the bottom, you can see the consequences of that. This shows the charging. Charging takes place during the day. You know, what a shock. Everybody's first assumption would be you want to charge at night. So what does this tell you? It tells you that the ancillary services market is so lucrative that you don't really care about the energy costs. Basically, you're going to charge up you know, whenever it's uh, profitable for you to participate or in a manner that makes it most profitable to participate in the market. The other thing to notice here is this shows you the individual vehicles in different shades, and it's very complicated. So just to bear in mind that even though in aggregate these look like very simple, uh, very simple uh, objectives, keeping the state of charge sta stable and bidding as much as you can, when it actually gets down to individual vehicles at the bottom, that translates into enormously complicated schedules vehicle by vehicle. Okay, I'm not going to focus much on this, just to say that uh, this picture at the bottom is the total load of the jail. Another reason that we don't care much about energy is that we're so tiny compared to the total, I said jail, base, the total load of the base. Uh, I've also worked in jail. So I've got, to, I've got to tell an anecdote now because since it came up, when I'm talking about this stuff abroad and I talk about two uh, demonstrations I'm working on, one's a jail and one's a military base, this really just confirms all the worst prejudices about the U.S. Where everybody's either in the military or in jail. If they're researchers, they're working on some of those institutions. So uh, I'm running out of time here, so I won't go into the details. What happened on this particular day is uh, this is a two-day period. The energy cost is $22. With this particular optimization, we made $83 on the first day in reg up. And uh, on the second day, we made $85, so you can see it's pretty stable. In reg down, we made $25 roughly, so you can see it's way less. Regulation up is where all the money is. So, you know, what does this mean in practice? So, bottom line, if you were able to do everything perfectly, as we are assuming here with this optimization, you might make about $100 per vehicle per month. You know, how much is that? Well, you've seen Nissan Leaf ads. Lately, uh, leasing them at about $200 a month. GSA normally assumes about $250 to $350 a month. So $100 a month, yes, certainly big enough to be interesting. But I don't think people are going to be lease, uh, leasing Nissan Leafs and leaving them parked to participate in auxiliary services markets. Okay, finally, I'll say just a word about uh, microgrids. This is the official definition uh, developed by Pat's office. There's two key features. One is that it's a locally controlled system, and the other is it can function either connected to a grid or islanded. And as I said, I organize a symposium every year on microgrids. Uh, this year it's coming up in uh, Santiago, 11th and 12th of September. I'd love to see you there. Again, it's by invitation only, but if you catch me today, you will certainly get one. And you can see the, you can see the webpage where you can get more information. 
So say, say Santiago de Chile, and the next word that I hear back is, wow, well, long flight. So I know it's a long flight, but the uh, redeeming feature is it's a long flight for everyone. Wherever you come from, it's a long flight for Santiago. <laughs> Unless anybody here is based in Buenos Aires or Asuncion or something like that. But it's well worth it. It's a great place to visit. <laughs> and, uh, I'm hoping I'm uh, going to see you there. Thanks. Oh, great. <laughs> I think we have time for actually one or two questions, if we have any of the other Chris Jonner, Tom, PG&E. Question for you. How, how are you going to, or what are your plans to assess um, the reduction in the life of the batteries of the EVs for participating in your market? Yeah, wh why did I know that that was going to be the first question? Sorry. Um, yeah, this is an enormously complicated question. I mean, the first thing I would note is that uh, batteries take quite a beating in mobile use of vehicles. Uh, the kind of charging that, and discharging that you're likely to be doing with ancillary services is actually not much compared to what happens in normal use of the vehicles. Uh, it could be under some circumstances, um, but you know we expect that it probably wouldn't be. And as you can see, that charging, uh, you know, wasn't that. It was varied between vehicles, but not that dramatic with any one vehicle. There's also some other reasons that you're not probably going to be wanting to charge and discharge the vehicle really rapidly. And one of those has to do with when you first plug in the vehicle, it takes a pretty high rate of charge for a very short period of time, and then tends to go into a trickle charge thereafter and the way that it works with Nissan Leafs is there's a target voltage and once you hit that target voltage this creates an incredible optimization problem because the charging is nonlinear that target voltage depends on temperature and you know other conditions so you know the bottom line is from the point of view of participating in the market the better thing to do is actually not charge at full power even though you can make a lot more money bidding as much power as possible into the ancillary services market the other thing I would mention is that, um, you know, this is if, if it were really true that uh, ancillary services market revenues are going to change the economics of electric vehicles, then in designing the batteries, you should be taking that into account. And so if the vehicles are going to experience this kind of treatment as opposed to their normal operating treatment, and this is something that uh, vehicle manufacturers are interested in, then the chemistry of the vehicles is going to start to change. And my colleague Venkat, I can't see him right now, is coming up this afternoon. Any difficult questions in that area should be directed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a question over here. Hi, Chris. Richard Shorsky with the Electric Vehicle Communities Alliance. A uh, couple questions on uh, on the whole project. One is around light duty vehicle integration and prospects for that. Uh, just, just a general one. I, I, our, my organization has been working with some manufacturers to just work on vehicle to building and vehicle to appliance, and I know that the grid issues are much, much more challenging. Yeah. So, um, you know, again, I'm a microgrid partisan. One of the corollaries of that is uh, what I'm really interested in is integrating vehicles with buildings and other resources, and then have those resources provide ancillary services to the grid or you know optimize uh, as a unit. Uh, you know, trying to manage all of these individual vehicles and other small resources in the grid. I mean, it's been mentioned a you know, hundred times already today what a huge challenge that is. One of the solutions to that is to try and integrate these resources in a more localized fashion and then have that entity participate in the grid. So, yes, vehicle to building, vehicle to microgrid, yes, I think these are really promising areas. Does that answer the question? Uh, sort of. Another, another <laughs> one is on the, now, I guess. <laughs> uh, the other one is on the Kaiso interconnect uh, and how that's going. Uh, I don't know anything about that. I'm sorry. The, uh, the interconnection agreement with Kaiso. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I mentioned uh, one of our biggest problems has been security. That one has actually been the biggest one. I mean, it's been about a, a, a more than a year now with negotiations between. Uh, the base, PUC, DOD, CAISO, and other parties have been progressing. And I think the way that it is starting to take shape now, and uh, Southern California Edison did just submit an advice letter for approval for a, a, um, 
I forgot the right word for it now, but a temporary tariff for the project. And uh, the way it's uh, emerging is that we will be settling all our energy retail, but we will be participating in the ancillary services market wholesale. And that's not what anybody expected at the outset, was that if we're dealing directly with Kaiso or Kaiso metered, et cetera, then uh, we'd be wholly in the wholesale market, and it's not uh, you know, emerging that way. Looks like we'll just be using ordinary retail metering for energy. But there's you know, a zillion other issues to get resolved there, so you, you probably understand. Right, I hate to cut this off, because I can tell that there are a lot of audience questions. I'm sorry, we have to move on, but I assume that Chris will stick around, so if anyone has more questions, maybe they can find you after. Um, but if you'll thank, uh, join me in thanking Chris one last time. So as Rachel mentioned, I'd like to report to the group today on some of the things we've learned on our um, pilot projects of PG and energy storage. Um, first of all, just the obligatory uh, opening. Uh, you know, PG, we're looking at this from a, from a grid perspective, moving from a traditional system to one that integrates renewables, to one with the ad that begins to service the advent of electric vehicles. And when you start looking at the gap between those, as you're all very aware, you start thinking about storage quite a bit. Um, and then the initial piece that enables all of that is what we loosely call the smart grid. Um, so our, at PG, our storage, energy storage portfolio, of course we have energy storage in hydro, pumped hydro. We've been using that for several decades now. Um, we have our sodium sulfur pilots, which is the, the subject I'm gonna to talk to you about today. And then we're also looking at compressed our energy storage on uh, an engineering study level with a, a, a federal grant. Our objectives in all of these are to really look, look at this from a technology neutral perspective and look at the grid needs. Um, and in order to do that, we really need to look at how do we evaluate these things in that, from that kind of a perspective. So our pilots are really aimed at that. So our, our battery energy storage pilots, we have two of them. One is currently operational, it's at the Vacadixon substation. Uh, you can see this on your way to Sacramento on I-80. If you look on the left side there, the Vacadixon substation. You really can't miss it, it's got 500 kV coming into it, 230 all the way down to distribution voltages. This two megawatt, seven hour uh, pilot project is located on the distribution bus there. This also served on that same distribution bus as another feeder that serves a two megawatt um, PV facility about a half mile away. So with this setup, we're looking at testing a couple different use cases. One, of course, is renewables integration. Um, second, it's, it's, a, it's a safe area to look at um, what we call load shaping. With the stiff bus, you have 500 kV at the back of the substation, you're not gonna move voltage around necessarily, you're not gonna cause any problems. Um, so it's a safe environment to really test and not worry too much about what you're gonna have happen on the grid. Of course, later you wanna know what you're gonna do with the grid, but for now it's a, it's a test. It's a safe place to do that. Um, and then of course we're working with the ISO um, to use this as a test bed for working, developing other uh, market products and ancillary services. Our second pilot project is here in San Jose at the HGST uh, headquarters over on Yerba Buena Boulevard. It's a four megawatt uh, battery. It's at their site, it's actually on the end of a very long distribution feeder. This will be operational next month. We're very excited about that. Um, I should probably give a shout out to Dave Freibush, who's, in the, who's our project manager on both of these. He's doing an excellent job. Um, with this location on the end of the feeder, we're going to be testing some other use cases in addition to the ones we're looking at at VACA. Of course, at the end of a feeder, we're looking at reliability issues. If you're using an energy storage device at the end of a very long feeder, um, how much can you charge and discharge at will before you're starting to influence voltages that are serving customers out there? Also, the impact it can have on, on shoring up and providing some power quality support. One of the unique features of this pilot is that being at the end of this, at the feeder, we will be able to island the load at the end of the feeder if the feeder goes down. So it's something, as we're looking at the advent of islanding and how should this fit into our electric grid, this will be a test bed for that. And of course, we'll also be looking at load shaping and ancillary services in this different environment with the additional constraints of being in the feeder. We have an operational plan. This is for the VACA 
uh, installation, which went operational late last year. Um, I don't know if you can see that. I'm looking up here, I can't see that, but hopefully you can see this. Um, we're in phase one right now. We're, I'm gonna show some, some results next on what we've looked at the thermal boundaries. These are sodium sulfur batteries, so they're, they're thermally limited. So we've been going through our test procedures to understand what those limits are and how, how we should develop our operational profile. Um, next we're looking at efficiency. Um, sodium sulfur batteries differ in efficiency depending on the state of charge. And we'll go on to power follow and telemetry testing, working with the ISO. Our next phase is looking at just once we understand how the batteries work and operate, working on the performance of that. Um, first off is working with the ISO and testing and helping them develop an EGR model and, uh, and the new markets and so on. Then we're also going to continue to look at peak shaving and, and load shaping. We have a, uh, one, of the, one of the things we've learned about and I'll talk to you about a little bit later is, is how do you control these? Do you have somebody sitting there? I mean, Chris just talked about that they're going to have some folks in the building there controlling the vehicles. And we don't necessarily want somebody sitting at back of substation or out of Hitachi um, or HGST, I guess is their technical name. <laughs> um, so how do we do that remotely? We're looking at doing that through our SCADA system. And then also, uh, primarily at the back installation, with the PV remote there, looking at how we would help to integrate renewables on a distribution level with the energy storage device at the substation, managing PV and the load served by that distribution system. And then finally, in, in phase three, looking at more advanced applications, we hear a lot of talk about stacking values and multi, multi um, dual and multi-mode operations. We'll be looking at testing that. So what have we learned so far at the two megawatt uh, facility at backup? We've gone, we completed an 11 week test looking at thermal boundaries. See they're kind of blocked out here. We started very conservatively, discharging at the, at the two megawatt rating for three, four, five, and working up to six hours. After that we reduced the, the discharge below two megawatts to go then longer durations. All with an eye to see how does this react thermally, because you, you can't be too hot, you can't be too cold with, with, these, with these batteries. Um, finally, culminating in week 11, we did a 10 hour discharge at uh, one and a quarter megawatts. We've just started our efficiency tests, and we're in the process of finishing our certificate, meter certification with the ISO so we can begin to participate in markets. Um, and that involves some end-to-end -end telemetry testing also. So here's a, here's a typical graph of what we do on a daily basis. Uh, the upper two lines, the red and the orange line, are your thermal limits. So 350 degrees C and 340 degrees C for shutdown and curtailment. If you hit that 340, the battery will start to back off. It will deviate from the profile that you've, you've commanded it with and it'll start to pull back. If you hit the 350, it's just gonna shut down. So uh, we obviously wanna develop our profile so we're well away from that, from that cliff. The yellow, the, excuse me, the red graph there is your maximum internal temperature. Um, you're monitoring temperatures throughout these battery modules and taking the maximum temperature. You, you want to keep any given cell from getting to that maximum temperature. And then you got the charge and discharge. You'll notice that you're never really at zero. You have to keep these hot. And the difference between the dashed line and the blue line, we're also tracking the difference between What's what we see on the DC side and the AC side. So looking at the losses on the conversion from DC to AC. So here's a, here's a sampling of different discharge rates. The, the key takeaway here is, look at the red line, we're well below any maximum temperature, so we're, we're very comfortable with this kind of discharge. Even down to the six and a half hour discharge, which is pretty much the rating of these batteries. So I pretty well already said this, but uh, we went, well, maybe the key takeaway here is that six and a half, 6.6 .6 hour discharge took us down to 10% state of charge. Um, we were well within the, the temperature bands. Uh, one of the things the manufacturer recommended we do five days a week. We really, we really saw that there isn't really a need for rest days. All that happens on a rest day is you spend money keeping the batteries warm. Whereas if you're, if you're discharging, if you're going through a profile, then they're much more efficient. The, the residual, the losses from operating the battery actually keeping it warm. 
Uh, we will revisit these results when we get toward the summer months to see how the impact of ambient temperature. The additional overlay now is, well, what, are this, what were the prices? Now, we're not fully integrated into the ISO market yet, but we're looking at LMP spot market prices at VACA to basically put together what, what these type of operations would cost. You can see the variation in uh, the price here, the gray curve. I think this is a January day. Carlos is our market guy. He's in the audience. I think this is January, right? So not a lot of deviation in January, but that's to be expected. So if you were trying to do price arbitrage with the battery in January, not a whole lot of opportunity. On the other hand, though, price spikes do occur. And if you're charging or discharging, that can be good or bad. And I don't know if you can see down below, we've, we've tried to track kind of how we're doing on a daily basis on the operational cost of the battery. Um, this can have a big impact if you, if you paid a premium to charge that battery at the wrong time. Uh, that, can, that can impact your operational costs. But the same token, though, negative prices can help you out at the right, at the right time, too. So we're looking at, do you want to try to optimize a, a general profile to react to things like this? I'm not sure. And I mentioned this already, you know, if it's a rest day, keeping the batteries warm, you're susceptible to whatever prices are occurring at that time. In this case, it, it was more costly to sit and rest. Our next, our next phase will be efficiency. Like I mentioned, we're going to look, look at a slightly different profile, getting rid of the rest in between the charge and discharge, trying to eliminate what, what, are, the, we're just, what are the operational losses and not what are the losses from, from resting between phases? So we'll, we'll charge right after a completed six hour charge. And we'll look at varying both the size and depth of both of the charge and discharge in this of efficiency. So last two slides here, I think the last two, are, but this is one I want to spend most of my time on. Um, is that how much time I have left? Or is that the time of day? <laughs> okay, five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> that says 159. <laughs> you know, there's not time for this slide. Okay, so uh, some of the things we've learned and gaps we've seen. On a regulatory level, it's difficult to justify storage. You'll notice that these are labeled pilot projects. What that basically means is there's not a economic business case for these. We justify these as a distribution asset based on the case that we need to see what the real applications are like. Um, when we pencil up a business case with existing values that you can actually monetize, it's a significant gap. But we feel that through identifying these gaps and showing the performances that we can help close those gaps with the ISO, the PUC, and other regulatory partners. Um, market integration. How do you model this in the ISO? I think I, I missed the ISO presentation a little bit. I think they talked a little bit about some of the things we're doing. Uh, we're working with the ISO. Um, initially, an energy storage device had to be modeled as a pump storage device. That can be limiting. Uh, pump storage devices can vary on the generation side, on the discharge side, but, they're, but they can't vary on the load side or the, or the, or the charge side. Now, with the new NGR model, we now can do that. So some of the progress we're making with the ISO. Um, some of the things that batteries like this could do is provide a very fast response. Well, we don't have a market yet with the ISO that really values fast response, but we're working together. That's one of those gaps I think we can close to help better uh, monetize what, what energy storage can do, specifically batteries. Um, within operations, within PG&E operations, this is, these pilots are distribution assets. So we have our distribution operators controlling them, but at the same time they have to be charged and discharged. That's a market function. So we have to go to our merchant arm and explain to them how this needs to be scheduled. So we're coordinating between two different lines of business that usually don't coordinate on this level. So we've had to create some new roles and responsibilities and, and train people to do that. So energy storage, is, because it has one foot in each side of those lines of business, we have to work together. And then, of course, with the ISO. Um, I think it was mentioned earlier that, uh, oh, no, I don't think it's, sorry. Um, if you have, if you're going to send a signal to the ISO, the ISO sends a signal that says, I want you to discharge, I want you to act like a generator. But the ISO can't really send you a signal that says, I want you to do negative megawatts, I want you to charge. Used to, their system sends a positive signal. So what we have to do is adjust, let's see, it's like a two megawatt resource. Well, we're going to 
we're going to set up a scale of 0 to 4 megawatts, and the ISO needs to know that they want us to act like a load, they need to send us a 0 to 2 megawatt signal. If they want us to act like a generator, they need to send us a 2 to 4 megawatt signal. So these are, these are some of the adjustments we have to make to work together in new technology in the existing environment. And I mentioned the last one, our control and visibility. Our SCADA systems are not designed to pre-program. So for example, if you want to have the output from a, a wind resource and have the battery respond to that, and you want an algorithm that describes that, whether it be just a, a normal droop curve like a generator or something more complex, SCADA system can't do that. So what is the platform which you do that? You need something that can interject real time into your SCADA, so we're working on that application. And that's been a lesson learned. I wanted to put this up as a data point. These are some of the costs that we've seen to date on our, on our projects. Um, of course, this is a typical of a pilot project. It's taken us a handful of years to develop these projects. We've learned a lot. If we did another one, it would, the costs I imagine would, I would hope would be a lot cheaper. But nonetheless, I think this is a good data point for us as an industry to look at, because our, in, our aim is to drive these costs down. So equipment, product, that's the cost of the batteries. Um, power control system. The, the communica communications application, that's the SCADA application I just mentioned. Installation. Um, this is our engineering and PG engineering and also our, um, our contractors for the installation. And then you have, to, you have to look at removal costs as a distribution asset. Financing costs, I've got an asterisk next to that. It's taking us five years to develop these batteries and our financing costs, I didn't want to skew this by putting the full financing cost up there. So that's a quarter of the financing cost, just for your reference. I'm assuming that as a, as a data point, this would we, would we would do this much quicker the next time. So total project cost, and you see cost per kilowatt there, we can quickly convert that to kilowatt per hour if that's a better com uh, comparison for you. I like I said, I think this is important for us to have this as a data point. We're going down from here. But I think this is a, a reality check for us. When, when we talk about implementing, we need to know this. We can drive down the product costs, the cost of the batteries, and everyone's very focused on that. And I think I hope we can continue to drive down the power electronics costs. The installation costs, that was a third party contractor. Um, our engineering costs, I hope those, that could be smaller with doing this quicker, that's over five years. But that's, that's where we're starting from and we're looking to move it down. Finally, um, I mentioned that our San Jose battery will be uh, energized and commissioned next month. We'll be having a ribbon cutting ceremony on the 23rd of May in conjunction with the ESA conference. Um, we are all invited to that. I don't, think, I don't think we put out a press release on that yet, but, but that's soon to follow. So that'll be at uh, 10 a.m. on the 23rd. We're going to come out and see the installation and there'll be some commissioners and things there too. So um, that, I think, we're the question. I'm actually going to throw out the first question. That's I hope it's not a silly one, but um, <laughs> you said that um, the California ISO doesn't currently have a market that um, is, is a fast response market. Um, Karen Edson was speaking this morning about something she called the five minute market. Is that is that not fast enough, or is that not developed, or I don't know? Do you know? <laughs> Can okay. Help I would I would argue, um, and I think my, many of you here might. I think there's value quicker than five minutes. Um, Charlie, do you have an answer to that? Yes, or a question. I also have a question, but the, the answer is quicker that than that. It's the pace of performance that was mentioned to you earlier that actually cracks the scanner time frame. So every four seconds of accuracy will uh, result in a uh, a. a pay for performance, uh, mileage is a term. So a, a question is, um, looking forward, are you uh, making an estimate of whether um, the mileage value, how that impacts the economics looking forward? I, my hope is, our hope is that we can show that as we help with the, work with the ISO to develop that market, and we go back and we do our business case analysis and the initial project, that we can show these gaps closing, and then as we look at costs coming down, that we can begin to show that this is more of an economical option. And, and there'll be a chance to compare early insight. I know both EPRI and Kima as part of our work for the PUC for um, the energy storage proceeding cost effectiveness evaluation are making our cuts at estimating what the mileage component will be circa 2015 and 2020. 
Uh, my, my question though, I, I think there's some uh, regulatory innovation that may be happening here. It's a, a D asset which, you know, if it was a commercial investment would go into rate base. The ancillary service and market particip participation components, energy and ancillary service, would you be self-providing those and then the benefit is basically you get a return on that capital investment and you're avoiding the otherwise purchase of those uh, products out of the market? So both of, great question, both of those are options. We could do it either way. In general, anytime you know, we were tracking on the bottom of those charts what the net cost of operations was, from a utility perspective, even though it's a distribution asset, we're able to, any, any net costs or net profits is what we're focused on, rolls right into our error account and so it, it subtracts from, from customer costs. Is that, I think that's answering your question, Brad. That answers that, but it, so the real benefit to you is really the rate-based investment and the return on the capital investment would be the utility motivation if it was cost-effective. If it was cost-effective. Um, well, I'll put that, when it is. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the benefit of these projects is to get real-life data so that we can know what we're, what we're getting into. Thank you. I, I want to, before I just end, I want to put a shout out, I, I omitted, and I should have said, this is a, we have a CEC grant for this project, and the learnings from these projects will be actually submitted, we're looking for EPRI as a subcontractor on that grant, and will be submitted as public reports, so that they're readily accessible, so. Rachel, is that the next? I think we have time for more. Oh, uh, thank you for the presentation. I uh, just wonder, I mean, I got two questions. One is why that particular technology of a battery uh, why, why select that one? Okay, it takes uh, a number of years to develop. Uh, the second part is, uh, 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 would uh, PG&E spin off a business unit uh, to uh, specialize in uh, uh, design plan and costing and installing the uh, distribution level microgrid? So the two, two questions. So, first question. When, when we evaluate these projects, our, our focus was not to, not to evaluate the technology, but to evaluate the, tech, the application. And so we, we picked what we thought, in our estimate, was the most mature battery technology out there, which is the sodium sulfur. Uh, even though now we look back and say we've, got, we've seen great progress in the last five years, at the time, we felt that that was the best technology. So we didn't have to worry about technology problems with the battery, we, we just focused on the application problem. Your second question, PG has no intention at this time. We're, we're dealing with this with our, with our existing business model. Mm. Um, hello, Gupta, California PUC. Uh, John, um, you showed a chart with install costs uh, that were fairly high, like $1,900 to $1,500 per kilowatt. Um, do you feel that that's more due to perhaps this being done first uh, one or two times, and do you think that will come down substantially with an experience curve? Um, I guess I'm trying to compare it with a combustion turbine installed, and the installed component there is fairly small uh, compared to the rest of the capital cost. So uh, I'm just wondering what your uh, thoughts are as far as future projected install costs. Absolutely, we would. If we did another one of these, it would be cheaper. Um, but I think the key is what, where would the reductions be? Um, the outside contractor, the PCS, I don't think there's a lot of reduction there in cost. Although they've been with us over this course of years, so they would be reduced by time. But the actual cost of services, I don't think, would be reduced much. Um, I'm hoping the product will reduce the actual purchase of the battery. That, that cost, I'm hoping, would come down. So I guess the two elements of time, we'd probably do it quicker, and because we'd be less hurdles to overcome, and then the cost of the, the batteries, I think, would uh, William Tador, Seaway Battery Company. We'll probably be in production this time next year, so I'm anxious to know what you have, what you think is a fair market cost for your system. That is a complex problem question <laughs> and problem. <laughs> we're driving this from both ends. I, I, we're, our focus is value, because regardless of what the cost of the product is, our opinion is right now that. The value that's out there you can actually realize with a product project is not sufficient. So we've got to get we've got to bring this down. Now, I think we're definitely getting closer. Sometimes we talk about battery product costs. We talk about and others talk about installation costs. Um, so 
instead of develop, you know, worrying about the, the cost of the product, we're very focused on the value proposition. And I, I'm confident that you guys can bring your, your product costs down if we can create the value and we can meet in the middle and make this happen. All right, if there are no more questions, how about one more round of applause? I apologize for not using the template. This is sort of a bad thing to say in the Microsoft auditorium, but I use the Apple Keynote software. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, can I just say that out loud? So, so uh, my name is Michael Srinivasan. I'm a scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. I do various things for the lab. One of the things that may be of interest to this community is I'm head of a department there focusing on various things, energy storage, being batteries being one of them, but demand response, vehicle to grid, this morning was talking about that, and thinking about what happens to the grid when you have a lot of distributed resources, right? What happens when everybody's buying a solar panel or putting on the roof? What we're going to do today is we're going to do a, a sort of a tag team. I'll start off and say a few things. I'll sit down and Jeff Anderson from CalCEP will stand up and say a few things. Doug Davenport from LBNL will stand up after that. I'll let Jeff and Doug sort of introduce themselves and tell you what they do in this whole context. What we're going to be talking about is what I have back there. We think there are some pretty amazing things going on in energy storage. Uh, it's all happening in the United States, but presumably it's all happening actually right here in California, much of it in Northern California. That's the story we want to talk about and tell you about today. We think the suns and the stars are all aligning to the point where we can actually think about the future as being something much better than the past. So just in terms of history, nobody makes large amounts of batteries in the United States today. We used to, we just stopped doing that. Much of it is lithium ion, and it's all made in Asia. And I think there are things that we're seeing that are changing that's going to help us get to some of the different point. And we're going to talk about how we can get there and what are the challenges in getting there. So the structure of my presentation is going to be, I'll do a little bit of the challenges in batteries. I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to talk about batteries for vehicles. And that's because, as we've heard before, if there are a lot of electric vehicles that come on board, it's both a challenge and an opportunity. So it's important for us to think about that. I'll also talk about batteries for the grid. And then I'll say a little bit about what is changing. How can we have a difference in the future? And how can we actually satisfy the need that all of us should be driving an electric car and have a battery in our backyard? Uh, I heard on NPR today that Jerry Brown was in Tsinghua University, and he actually made a statement that we want to all drive electric cars, and I'm going to ask all the people in Tsinghua to help us do it. I'm going to give you option B. I think we can do it right here, and we'll talk about how we can do that. What I'll do after that is I'll ask Jeff to stand up and say a little bit about what we've been doing in this consortium called CalCharge, and we'll sort of explain that, and then we'll step back and Doug will stand up and say something about what Lawrence Berkeley has been doing to enable the companies to stand up and do things at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So there was a comment made earlier about how you know, we are probably seventh or eighth or tenth or something in materials. So I'm a battery guy. I'm not a material scientist, but I work with a lot of material scientists. And I want to say a few things, right? So, uh, you know, the, the battery group at Lawrence Berkeley has uh, 15 people, scientists. If you count postdocs and graduate students, we have 60 people, all focusing on batteries. Probably 50 of them are material scientists. Okay? Uh, I'll sort of hit upon the kinds of things that material science has given us in batteries in the United States. But every one of you have probably has a cell phone. I'm pretty sure you do. All of them have a lithium ion battery in them. The electrolyte solvent in the lithium ion battery was invented at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So that's a material, by the way. So that's the sort of the history that we bring to the table in this country. Let me actually start off with the challenges when it comes to electric vehicles. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to show you a slide that I love to show, which is a slide. It's called a Rigoni plot. The y-axis of this plot is a specific energy. The x-axis is specific power. Think of the y-axis as a range in an electric car. So the higher the energy, the more range you can go before you have to recharge the battery. Think of the x-axis as specific power. How quickly can you go from 0 to 60? So you want to be in the top right corner of this graph. The internal combustion engine in energy is outside this graph, right? The energy is so high that it doesn't even fit into this graph. That's the competition when it comes to electric cars, right? We're trying to make electric cars that can presumably compete with gasoline cars, presumably. And you can see the challenge right here. What I'm also showing you is the energy and the power of different chemistries that people have tried in the past. Many of these have actually come out of labs in the United States, by the way. What you're showing here is that as you start looking into the latest chemistries, lithium ion, from an energy and power perspective, it's sort of taken over. That's why all cell phones are lithium ion in them. All the vehicles that are coming out are slowly moving to lithium ion. They're not already lithium ion. What I'm also showing you are the requirements defined by the Department of Energy and the car companies, the big three auto manufacturers in the US. 
In terms of what you need, if you want to have everybody driving an electric car, what this shows you is that you are approximately a factor of two to five from where we need to be if you want to make an electric car completely ubiquitous. So think of it this way, right? Uh, today you can buy a Nissan Leaf. How many of you have a Leaf? A few of you, that's great. So the Leaf has a range of seven miles. So it works for certain people, not for everybody. But what if you can go 150 miles? It works for some more. What if you can go 350 miles? Works for everybody, right? All of us can go buy a Nissan Leaf. Essentially, that's the challenge. And depending upon the car and how you design it, you have a challenge that is somewhere between two times and five times where it needs to be in energy density before electric vehicles become ubiquitous. If they become ubiquitous, then B2G becomes a solution that we all should be thinking about very carefully because we'll have one in our home every day charging and discharging. Right? So this is the first big challenge that we're all worried about. But it's not about energy density oftentimes, especially when it comes to grid scale storage batteries, right? Most of us thinking about grid scale storage aren't worried about energy density because we figure in the US we have tons of space to put our stuff. But it's all about cost. So what I'm showing you here is a oops, is the dollars per kilowatt hour on the y-axis with years for consumer electronic batteries. So these are lithium-ion batteries for consumer electronic applications. Very expensive some years ago, cost decreasing pretty significantly. Think of this as companies paying off their plans, economies of scale, some cost reduction in the manufacturing side, all put together, showing the reduction in energy in cost pretty significantly from year to year. So just in terms of thinking about a Moore's law for batteries, uh, Moore's law for energy density is 5% a year. A Moore's law for cost is maybe 8%, so give or take. So that's kind of the numbers that we typically talk about. These are small, maybe 3 amp hour, 4 amp hour, 18650 cells, okay? If you want to drive a car, if you go to Tesla, you need 7,000 of them. Right? So what you have to do is you have to make a battery pack. Something big, something that's pretty large, something that's going to be considerably safer, can be charged in a considerably different fashion, can be discharged in a different way. If you do all that, those batteries can be expensive, somewhere around $800 a kilowatt hour. Part of the reason is because we don't make many of those batteries today. Simple because there is no market for driving electric vehicles today. It's a pretty small market. So that is something that is very, very expensive. But presumably what's going to happen is as we start building more plants, the same economies of scale is going to kick in. These costs are going to come down. That is indeed true. People have estimated that. And the feeling is that if all these plants come on board that are making electric vehicle batteries, these costs will come down to maybe in the order of $400 to $500 a kilowatt hour. The Department of Energy has been telling us that if you want to get electric cars, you've got to be at $125 a kilowatt hour. A question came up earlier, how do you value storage for the grid? It's a very difficult question, right? I mean, you could see Pat Hoffman refused to answer the question. Dan Rassner is here. He's been thinking about this all his life. You can make money on the grid if you're somewhere here. That's what people will tell you. I asked this question to my DOE program manager. I have funding from ARPA-E to develop a flow battery. And he keeps coming and beating us, saying he wants us to give him a battery that's $100 a kilowatt hour. That's the number I put on this graph. It's down there, right? Look at the difference between those two. It's a factor of three to five, depending on how you count. His logic is simple. He says, yes, you can make money on the grid today with batteries, but he wants the ultimate battery. He wants a battery that will defeat any other reason to use any other technology. You only buy a battery because that's the cheapest option in front of you. And he says, for you to do that, you've got to be at $100 a kilowatt hour. That is a second challenge. But it's not about energy density and cost alone. Most of us know this when you're developing a battery. You've got to make it incredibly safe. And that's very important. And you've got to make sure that you can hit the, it's not just the cost of energy. That's going to happen at low temperature. That's going to happen at high temperatures. Are you going to make sure that this thing is going to work in all the applications that you're choosing for? That ends up becoming a very big challenge in batteries. So what do we do about all this, right? Well, it turns out batteries are all about materials. Right? So that's why this is a very important thing. So the way you make a battery is fairly simple. You have an anode, you have a cathode, you have a separator. Slap them together. You can do it in multiple ways. You can flow them. You can make them into a container. Basically, the building blocks are an anode, a cathode, and a separator. You then have to take these materials and you have to manufacture them at scale, make them into a package cell, and do all the things that you have to do to make it successful in the marketplace. But at the basic core level, it comes down to those materials. If you take, say, an, a, a lead and an oxide and a lead sulfate and a sulfuric acid electrode, you have a lead, lead acid battery. If you take nickel, cadmium, potassium hydroxide, you have a nickel cadmium battery. Similar for lithium ion. If you take a lithium-containing cathode, a lithium-accepting anode, and if you put a lithium-containing salt in a non aqueous solvent in the electrolyte, then you will have a lithium-ion battery. You can change the cathode material, you can change the anode material, you can change the electrolyte. They're all called lithium-ion batteries. That's what I'm listing down here. 
the different combinations of cathodes, anodes, and electrolytes. You can do the same thing for a flow battery. You can change the analyte, you can change the catholyte, you can change the electrolyte, you can have gases, you can have liquids, you can have solids. They all form a basis of what we call a flow battery. And there are companies in this room and people in this room doing different kinds of flow batteries and lithium batteries. The idea behind this is very simple. As you change the materials, as you change the chemistry, you have new things that show up. Advantages for some of these metrics, disadvantages in other metrics. That's the game we all play. The problem we're having is this particular game doesn't allow us to ultimately get to where we need to be if you're looking for the ultimate battery, right? So the idea is simple. You're gonna be selling the battery you have today, waiting for the ultimate battery to show up, and you do more and more research and development and deployment to get to the point where you get to the ultimate battery. Okay? So the question is, how do we get to something which is the next generation of battery research? What's gonna happen five, 10, 15, 20 years from today? I'll make a point about materials in this particular slide. This particular material here, the layered oxide, invented in the United States. Invented in the United States, the spin-out. The olivine was invented in the United States also. Carbon invented in the United States. Alloys in Germany, oxides in the US. Liquid electrolyte solvents in the US. So just going back to materials and where it's invented, that's in the United States. That's not the problem, and I'll tell you the problem in a second. Let's now think about how we're gonna do something much, much better than what we have today. Well, this is where the federal government has put an investment, a fairly large investment, in this entity called the Energy Storage Hub. For those of you who don't know what a hub is, this is Steve Chu's vision for how research can be done in the United States. He was at Bell Labs, was influenced by the fact that in Bell Labs, you would have scientists and engineers all working together under one roof, having water cooler conversations, and that water cooler conversations and that one roof concept leads to innovation, a spark that would be very different from what you would do if you were siloed. His feeling was in the US, we are siloed. So he came up with this concept of what he calls the le Bell Lablets, a hub where you put people together, ask them to start working. These are people who will be from multiple skill sets. They'll be material scientists, they'll be chemical engineers, they'll be organic chemists, inorganic chemists, you know, people from all across the spectrum. They'll all be sitting, working together, and the hope is that if they do that, magic will happen. So this is a partnership that Argonne National Lab is leading. Argonne is in Chicago, along with Berkeley Lab. This is something that I've been working on for the past three years with Argon. I'm one of the deputy directors of this hub. The idea behind what we're doing is very simple. Here is the partnership, and what we're doing is what I call the moonshot for batteries. We're trying to develop a battery that will have five times energy density at one-fifth the cost, and they want to do that in five years. So people who know batteries will look at this and say, that's pretty much impossible. And that's the point of the hubs. Hubs are supposed to think about an impossible goal come up with those impossible ideas that you wouldn't have come up with if you did not have an impossible goal, and go do the research that's required to do that. If you were to embark on a journey like this, the idea is that five, 10, 15 years from today, you will have something that you thought was impossible at this particular moment. Right? That's the point of what Steve Chu was trying to push, and that's what we're trying to embrace here, and that's what we're trying to do. If everything goes well, I'm an optimist, if everything goes well, in five years' time, I'll be standing up here, in holding in my hands a battery, that has something very different from what we have today. So we won't be doing lithium ion, we will be doing something that is like a magnesium or an aluminum that carries a plus two or a plus three charge. The idea being that if you can get there, then you can have significantly higher energy density than what you have today. We'll be doing things that are beyond what is happening in the lithium ion space today, working on a lot of lithium metal based chemistries. We'll be doing you know, flow battery chemistries, except we'll be coming up with new chemistries for flow batteries. We'll be using theory to do some of this. We'll be using very advanced characterization to come up with these concepts. And we'll be coming up with synthesis tools that has never been invented before, right? Things that are completely new and at the forefront of science. What I'll be doing, as I told you, is standing up here with something in my hand saying this battery is better than any battery that's been made before. If you want to go to the market and deploy this, you, want, you have to be holding the steering wheel of a tractor trailer in your hands or a big rig with the energy storage device that's in the back. It's going to be huge. It's going to be a megawatt hour, right? The question is, how do we go from this lab scale battery that this program is going to try to invent to something that's on a big rig that's going to be satisfying your grid scale battery storage requirements at, at PG&E or one of those sites that we were talking about? It turns out, if you look at the battery industry and ask, how long does it take to go from lab to market? The average answer depends upon the company and depends upon the problem. It's anywhere from five to 10 to 15 years. Okay. Let's take an average, let's say it's 10 years. Okay. So it takes 10 years for us to go from a lab, so I sit in the lab and I say, this kind of material seems to work, I kind of cycled it, I published my paper in science, I'm done. I'm gonna give it to that person and say, you go commercialize it. It'll take 10 years by the time we get the market. It's been done in five years, it's been done in three years actually in some cases. 
but it's a hard challenge. The question is, how do we succeed in accelerating this innovation? It's not just about finding new materials. It's also about kind of deploy them in the field. Right? This is where I think we have to start thinking very carefully about what the future holds for us. And I would argue with you that the way you accelerate innovation is by having a collaboration. And I'll talk about what the collaboration ought to be. Let me first tell you what the challenge is. Today, we have batteries that look like this, low energy, high cost. We want batteries that are very high energy so that we can go all the miles we need to go at very low cost. I already told you what is needed to do this. You've got to come up with brand new materials. We are doing that in the United States. But it's not about materials. You've got to actually go manufacture them. And you heard from various people today who actually are doing that also, or trying to do that in the United States. But it's not about just these two. You have to think about the markets you have to go after. A123 is a great example where they did not think about the market. They don't exist anymore. Chris Marnay made this point about how if you think about the vehicle to grid market, and if you start thinking about how you're going to monetize the battery using the vehicle to grid market, you might have to change the materials. Imagine a world where you're co-locating the materials with the manufacturing, with the markets. That co-location actually exists. It exists in China. But there is another place where it exists, and that's right here in California. And if you really think about what is happening in California, it is an amazing story. So what I'm listing here is the various things that are going on in the California region, in the energy storage space, just in terms of the overall place where these companies are playing. So we have approximately 40 plus battery companies in the California region. Approximately 35 of them are the Northern California region. There could be more in Southern California. I don't go that often, so it's very difficult to find out what's going on there. These companies are vehicle companies, they are grid companies, and there are companies going up with consumer electronic applications. And I kind of talk about this all the time. The road to an electric vehicle battery is through the consumer electronic market. You really have to think about that because markets are important. You have to think about the fact that it's not just about battery companies, right? It's a whole supply chain. We have companies focusing on anode and cathode materials. We are ones that are trying to make a better battery, meaning an electrode and a cell. We are ones that are thinking about a pack. We are ones that are thinking about battery management systems. We have companies trying to make a equipment for a battery. We have the end users, meaning the PG&Es of the world, the Southern California Edison's of the world, Qualcomm, Intel, Apple, they're all here. So is Tesla, so is Mission Motors, so is Zero Motorbikes. All the end users, every big company you can think of that is interested in energy storage is here in California. When we started seeing the story evolve, it became clear to us that we have to do something about this. This is the kind of ecosystem that was there in Silicon Valley when the first initial phases where Stanford started sending out all these different you know, contracts and microwaves and there was all this amazing activity going on. This is the kind of stuff that leads to what happens in pharma in Boston or in the biotech boom that's been going on in San Diego. It's a very similar kind of ecosystem. What we decided that we have to find a way to pull all this together. So Berkeley Lab has teamed up with CalCEP and with Slack, the, the Stanford Accelerator and Mark Cartney is here from Slack, trying to think about how are we going to pull all this together? How are we going to make sure that we can actually get all these companies to start working with the various universities and national labs in the California region, both in Northern and Southern California, to start making a big difference in energy storage space. So what I will do is I will go to the next slide and hand over to Jeff Anderson. Jeff is the interim uh, director of CalCharge. And Jeff will say a little bit about what is going on in the CalCharge space. Mr. Anderson. <laughs> feel a little guilty interrupting Ben Katz's flow, we should just keep going. Um, so uh, I'm Jeff Anderson, I'm a managing director at CalCEP, the California Clean Energy Fund, and acting as interim executive director of, uh, of CalCharge. Let me give you just two seconds on, on CalCEP to explain why this partnership made sense to, uh, to pull CalCharge together. CalCEP's an interesting animal, we're a series of nonprofits uh, under one umbrella, all with a combined mission of how do you uh, help address the, the market finance policy barriers that are preventing the scaling of clean energy deployment. Uh, and uh, to do that, we actually have a think tank, uh, an investment fund that we actually use to make for-profit investments to stand up groups of concepts and new financial products, new business models, um, new institutions uh, that help address those barriers. And uh, in part, thanks to the great work of uh, Doug and Venkat, uh, we now have a new arm, uh, a 501c6 trade association uh, platform as well, and that's what we're standing up CalCharge on. Uh, and we're not standing uh, the, the, the trade association up as a one-size-fits-all. 
uh, kind of let's create the Uber trade association with a value proposition subject the lowest common denominator. Instead, let's actually create a series of programs that are specific to the unique problems of subsectors, of communities, uh, of technology developers. Um, and so CalCharge is one of the first of those on that platform. Uh, and it's designed to address that, that previous slide that, that uh, uh, Ben Kat had, which is um, look at the opportunity and look at the challenge. In California, there's this, this emergent ecosystem. There's this, this cloud, you will, of uh, diffuse players, of big companies focused on uh, uh, utilizing battery technologies and investing in new uh, innovative technologies. You've got the innovative young companies that are right now kind of innovating in a vacuum because they have no direct connection to the big boys who actually have the budget and the problems they're willing to pay for it. You've got, as uh, Joshua Barlev said earlier, you have uh, some of the best uh, government programs uh, in the country, if not the world, trying to drive uh, energy storage development, uh, who don't necessarily have the best pathways to communication to the private sector. And then you've got facilities like Berkeley Lab and Slack that are, have a mandate to not only do basic R&D, but to find ways to work with the private sector and the government to get these things into the commercialization cycle so that they actually go from just, wow, look at the great uh, new electrolyte we invented, and wow, didn't that really produce a great battery in China, to, hey, look what we produced, and look what it actually produced here at home. Um, the problem is, when you have that diffuse cloud, there's only so many point-to-point -point interactions one participant in that cloud can actually handle. Um, you've got to sleep sometime. You've got to actually do the rest of your job. So the, the, the challenge, well, theoretically, you have to sleep. Um, uh, Venka has an eight-month-old, I have two-year-old twin, so it's really not an issue anymore. Um, uh, so the, the challenge that, uh, that was surfaced, in fact, uh, was surfaced last year at this exact symposium was, what can we do? How can we create a framework to coalesce this cloud, to create a center of gravity around which it will coalesce? Uh, and so that all the players in the market can actually exchange information more readily, have built in series, a built-in series of relationships, so that you can better leverage the existing resources in that market, in that, in that community, to support the development of the entire community. Um, and what we came up with uh, was, was CalCharge. Uh, which is an uh, innovation accelerator for uh, the energy storage sector. Um, uh, it's going to be an interesting animal. So uh, we announced it last year as a concept with a vision of creating that center of gravity. Uh, we've been diligently working on it for the past year and are starting to operationalize it. Last month we announced one of our first programs. Uh, in two weeks on May 3rd we'll actually be announcing uh, the launch of our technology acceleration program and the launch of our membership, uh, opening up membership to potential applicants. Uh, and I'm going to give you just a little sneak peek of it here just because this is where kind of, uh, you're the ones who got us all in trouble and made me work for the last year. Um, so you're going to have to hear about it a little bit. Um, it's going to be four program areas in, in CalCharge. Uh, first is technology acceleration, which is, you know, this sounds simple, but what it really means is how do we identify what are those critical resources, human expertise, uh, physical resources, uh, information resources that we can, we, that exist in the community that we can find, we can create streamlined pathways for any member of the community to better leverage to support their, uh, the, 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 uh, their technology development. Uh, and one of the first examples of that, that we'll be announcing on May 3rd, that I'm going to ask Doug to talk about in some detail, uh, is uh, a, a new uh, project with uh, Berkeley Lab, we've basically been able to take, um, right now, in order to do a collaborative research project using Ben Katz, uh department at Berkeley Lab, if you were an individual company and wanted to come in, uh, it would take between 9 and 12 months for you to negotiate an individual project. That's even if everyone's completely aligned, it's just how long it takes. We've been able to take that process, we believe, and get it down to somewhere around a month. Uh, and we'll be announcing the details of that on May 3rd, and Doug will give you a sneak peek of it in a second. And we hope to do the same with some of the other national labs in the area, uh, and with uh, some of the private user facilities, the accelerators in the area. What are those common sets of resources that it's in our common interest to better leverage? So that's technology acceleration. Uh, the next is professional development. Uh, as most of you know who are in this space, there really is no such thing as a degree in batteries. Uh, this is a multidisciplinary field. 
Uh, this is actually kind of the ultimate in tilting at windmills in some sense. If you think about what it takes to, to actually really develop uh, a battery and integrate it into a system, it takes a, a pretty wide set of skills. Um, and if this community, if this sector is going to scale the way it needs to to meet the opportunities and the challenges uh, that our, uh, that our society faces, we have to actually accelerate the growth of the professional um, uh, professionals actually able to uh, play in this field. And so we announced uh, last month, actually in late February, uh, a partnership with San Jose State University to uh, an, create a professional education program for batteries. Um, and I suspect in two weeks, what, uh, and that, that announcement went extremely well, by the way, so much so that I suspect in two weeks, uh, on May 3rd, you'll have another announcement from us that we're maybe going from just a series of professional education programs to possibly a degree program of some kind, possibly the first that actually exists in the country. So stay tuned for that. I have to keep in the conditional tense for now, but very exciting. Um, then next is uh, ecosystem facilitation, which is if you map out all of the resources that exist in this diffuse cloud, even if you create a center of gravity for them, um, you know, where are the gaps, first of all? What are the, what are the things that don't exist in, uh, in common resources that you can better make use of that you can facilitate identifying new resources to fill those gaps? Where can you, can, where can you go for the, uh, the DOE grants, the RPE grants, the SBIR grants to uh, address those common concerns underlying the development of the ecosystem as a whole? Um, or, better yet, uh, where are those connections that should exist anyway between members of that cloud? Uh, hey, you have an interesting anode design, you have an interesting cathode design, your peanut butter, your chocolate, you two should get together and actually have a conversation about what you can do together. Um, and so we're going to be launching a series of, I like that, I thought it was good, but it didn't seem to work. Um, <laughs> you know, it's a tough crowd, it's a tough crowd. Uh, and so we'll be uh, announcing a series of programs designed over the course of this year to begin to uh, demonstrate that. And then finally uh, is uh, commercialization support, which is once you've created the framework to, to pull this, this, this group together, uh, how do you actually, um, uh, you know, what, what you've actually built, let me phrase it, phrase it this way, what you've actually built is kind of a broad intelligence network. You've suddenly got unbelievable insight into the technology and market trends that are happening in, in, uh, in the sector. Uh, and what we need to do is create a feedback loop uh, through CalCharge that actually gets that intelligence back to the community. So that can shape business model development, so it can help people shape their technology development programs. Uh, and so you'll be seeing some, uh, some initiatives coming out of CalCharge this year around that. So uh, that's what we did in our summer vacation, uh, and uh, we're good. As I said, on May 3rd, there'll be an event at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Uh, we have a limit on our capacity, uh, so if you haven't registered yet and want to learn more, we, I suggest you go to our website uh, and register as soon as possible, uh, and then you'll get the uh, you'll hear the, the full download. And in the interim, what I want to do is pass it on to Doug Davenport, who actually is going to talk uh, in detail around. Uh, the collaborative research uh, project program that we're going to be announcing uh, on that day. Thanks. So I realize that this photo montage is not as exciting as Santiago, Chile. Uh, and I will put in a plug that if anybody does go to this conference, I know a place in Santiago, I spent a few days there, that has a sandwich that will bring you as close to heaven as you can possibly go uh, while here on Earth. It's literally that good. Uh, so I, I'm Doug Davenport. I'm with Berkeley Lab. It's been my pleasure to be partnering with, with Ben Cat to take this vision and bring it into a constructive reality. And to be uh, partnering with Jeff and with CalSAF to bring this business model forward. You heard it here first. Last year we were here with two people talking about the vision. This year we've got three. Next year it's three people and a battery. Right? You heard that? So that's where we're going to go. So you know, my job here is to tell you what this means. Okay? Uh, what you see behind you is really just a construct of what we're trying to create here in technology acceleration. When you run a program uh, that is dedicated to incrementally improving uh, important parts of a very complex battery system like we do with the Batteries for Advanced Transportation Systems program. And then you're involved with a program that's really reaching out and finding new chemistries and new designs and new forms of energy storage. 
uh, like we're going to be doing with Jay Caesar and with Argon. Uh, that brings you uh, a collection of people, and it brings you a collection of resources and facilities that are really unmatched. And we realize that we have something really, truly special here, possibly some of the best that you can find in the world. And what we wanted to do is, is basically unlock the potential that exists there uh, for our partnerships with industry. And so if you're looking at uh, you know, a play in materials, if you're looking at really needing to understand uh, the design or the design aspects of a battery that uh, a company is trying to actually create and put onto the market. Or you want to look at manufacturing issues or fabrication issues, you want to look at performance issues, you want to look at uh, other aspects of translating your particular technology uh, position today into another one, for example, from consumer devices into transportation. We have the resources to assist, we have the resources to facilitate, and we have the, uh, the, uh, the equipment and the lab space and the, uh, the, the resources that it takes uh, that actually complement what a company needs. And we see that as a tremendous offsetting and risk-reducing feature that we can provide. So I want to talk to you about here, uh, and we'll be unveiling this in more detail on May 3rd, but what we have done is we have taken a, a collaborative research and development agreement. And it's only a few agreements that a national lab can actually use to partner with industry. Collaborative research and development agreement is something that's driven by statute. It is not always easy to negotiate. Uh, the nine month to 12 month time frame that we spoke of is not a joke. That's the only non-funny thing we've tried to say today. Uh, what we try to do is fundamentally look at that agreement. I have one minute to tell you that uh, what we're talking about here is, is taking an agreement that is normally met between an industry and a national lab, generally to, to look at a very large project. We've inserted a task order process and a business process that allows you to do small projects. We've also looked at fundamentally the IP rights, the IP management, and the information and publication process that goes along with that CRADA. And we've worked with our partners in the Department of Energy to create a system that puts the partner in greater control over the, the generation of intellectual property, the ownership of intellectual property, the disposition of information, and the publication of information. We think that's tremendously important so that we can, we can assure a company, our business partner, our industry partner, that what they do with us is going to result in something that's protective of them and, and assures a faster path to market. This is our sincere hope that we can work with a large number of companies in this ecosystem and help to facilitate uh, a, you know, a greater degree of participation with our lab. So that's, that is what we have to talk about. We're very excited about this. We look forward to hearing uh, lots of questions and seeing many of you on May 3rd. All right, thank you. We actually have five minutes left for questions. That's why, uh, that's why we cut you off. Five minutes in advance of the agenda item. So do we have any questions from the audience? Well, the Asian nations uh, seem to have uh, put the national treasury behind uh, the projects. Uh, uh, Caltrack sounds really like something uh, will uh, measure up uh, against uh, the, uh, the Asian effort so far on battery technology. But what about uh, money? Uh, did the government of the U.S. Uh, uh, make a commitment uh, to put the money where uh, it should be? Well, we spoke about that, right? That is the problem. <laughs> No. The reality is that you know it takes $100 million to build a battery plant, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less. This is for a lithium-ion battery plant. Flow batteries are kind of interesting in that concept, actually. You can actually do something in the U.S. if you're running a flow battery industry, but that's a separate question. You still need a lot of capital. Uh, you know, this is not an easy time to raise capital. I mean, Solyndra does not help you, right? That's the reality. And for all the VCs in the room, I mean, this has been a tough, tough, tough challenge. It's not something that turns around in two years, like Facebook was. Well, two years on Facebook. It just takes a long time to actually get something out of the door. And you know, that means that we have to be creative. We have to think very hard about how we're going to finance these things, get it to the point where we can get to some sort of lot money. Let me give you some examples, right? Uh, you can think of it not just as you have to raise the money yourself and you've got to do it. Batteries for grid and vehicles are so large that it makes sense that it will be manufactured close to the markets. 
What I mean by that is it's going to be like cars, right? Toyota makes the cars in the U.S. The value presumably is in Japan. What if there is a way in which we can find a leveraging idea where the innovation happens here, the monies come from elsewhere, where there is money today, and that our, the manufacturing happens here because that's where it makes sense. It's locally done because that's where you want to put the battery plant because it's right next to the, you know, sort of the grid scale application that you're going to shoot for. You don't want to be shipping it across the whole world. Maybe there are some interesting stuff that you can do there. But money remains the challenge. More questions? Hi, thanks for your presentation, uh, Joe Jordan at San Jose State, as well as uh, College Action over in Santa Cruz. Um, you know, it occurs to me that uh, part of the dream of batteries is, yeah, so we can integrate renewable energy, which is clean. But the batteries themselves, um, I was just realizing everybody knows that, uh, you know, toxics is a, an issue there. But I don't know that you guys addressed that. I'm sure you're working on it. And, Supposedly batteries are 90% recyclable, but there's still a hell of a lot of toxics that are involved in that cycle. So whatever comments you can make on that, I'd appreciate it. Right. I think what's happening is that part of our thinking has changed over the years. Uh, sustainability has become a very important part of our thinking. It used to be that we were just doing things from a scientific perspective because it is cool science, right? Let's do that. But that is changing. Uh, let me give you an example of that. One of the one of the problematic processes that is happening when you make a battery is that there is a particular solvent that you use. That's actually an environmental hazard. And that solvent has to be removed, has to be evaporated. There are a lot of challenges in doing that. One of the things we're working on is making it dry so that you don't have to use the solvent. So that concept of thinking about the toxicity, thinking about what is going to happen when you start putting it in the ground, all of that is starting to seep into the battery community. It is a collaborative effort that will involve thoughts like that, in addition to just the basic chemistry and the science behind it. Um, my name is Matt Rappaport from IP Checkups. My question is, has there been any interest or, um, to this point at least, from industry to um, invest in this opportunity similar to what's happened at the EBI uh, with BP investing in the Energy Biosciences Institute, which I believe uh, Stephen Chu oversaw that connection while he was still at the university. So this is fundamentally a different thing, I think. You know, um, the, the Department of Energy is making a massive investment in Berkeley Lab uh, in the Batteries for Advanced Transportation program. They're also making a big investment in this energy storage hub. Those two things represent uh, a fairly significant amount of money, I want to say on the order of 40 or 45 million together. Uh, and that, what we're trying to do here is actually create a, a mechanism by which the, the, the resources that are amassed through that kind of effort and the people that you can bring together in that kind of effort to actually make that more easily available to industry. So there's a bit of a, a share that we're bringing in the fact that we have these facilities and we have these, these resources and these people that we can actually use those in, in uh, partnership with the industry. Uh, and so we're working, on, you know, in CalCharge we'd be working on a more of a membership based model and actually the uh, the implementation of a project under this kind of innovative form of CRADA is, is meant to be kind of cost reimbursement based. That does not cost a penny to the industry in terms of the equipment being utilized or the facilities being utilized. This is all about just leveraging the fact that these things are here. I hope that helps. Okay, I think we're out of time. Uh, but thanks once again to our speakers. and. So um, I'll describe a study that we're doing for the California Energy Commission to look at the role that the automated that automated demand response and storage can play in managing the variability and the uncertainty associated with operating a power grid with 33% uh, intermittent renewable. So we're looking forward to the year 20, uh, 2020 when we have 33% renewables and looking at you know some of the challenges that pose those pose and what we might uh, do about them. So we've, um, we've been working on the project for about 18 months now, and we're at the point where we're just starting production runs, but we don't have any results we can share with you yet. But, um, so I'm going to describe the modeling approach we're taking. And there are principally three different types of models here. One is a high-resolution weather model that models um, you know, the, the flow of wind and solar radiation, as well as the uncertainty associated with those phenomena. Uh, the second one is a production simulation model that takes uh, the renewable generation, including its uncertainty, 
and minimizes the cost of operating the system under those conditions. And then the third one is a system stability model that we use as a check to just make sure there's enough inertia in the system to handle very short-term support of, you know, sub-second time scale uh, disturbances. Uh, and then I want to describe um, some of the data that we're using to model storage technologies uh, in, in our system and you know, uh, see if you agree with uh, the assumptions that we're making and then just a brief summary. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, our study, we're going to look at the role storage and demand response can play in terms of cost effectiveness. So we're going to, all these problems that you know, Chris was talking about in terms of telemetry and control of um, automated demand response and storage systems, we're going to assume all those engineering details that Chris has solved those. And we're just going to look at the economic dispatch with five minute economic dispatch signals um, to see uh, if we can, uh, how we integrate those systems. Um, so looking ahead to the year 2020, um, okay, here we go. Uh, this is a graph of um, the hours and the net load, being the gross load minus renewable generation, gives you the net load that the independent system operator has to meet with uh, conventional resources. And so this is starting at midnight. And the first thing to notice here is, okay, so we get the usual dip around 3 or 4 a.m. where you have very low system loads. And then you get, you know, the 7, 8 a.m., Peak when people are getting up and making you know breakfast and stuff and this is uh I should mention this is an April day so it's a fall or spring day or relatively low lows but then due to all this solar generation in the system you get a net load minimum at about 1 p.m. that's even lower than the 3 a.m. load so we're gonna have a dramatically different net load that we have to manage at, at, at Kaiso year 2020 assuming we have 33 percent renewables and then you have this huge ramp up this is about 14 gigawatts in four hours uh, going from the, the, the daily min up to the seven seven o'clock peak when everybody's getting home from work and then it drops back off so there's a very different net load shape uh, that you have to handle under 33 percent renewable in the year 2020 um, the other thing I want to point out is the variability in the renewable generation, which of course translates into variability in net load. As you can see right here, this isn't just one curve, it's a whole family of curves. And that's how we um, represent the uncertainty in our modeling approach. And in conventional approaches, <clears throat> you generate you know, one point trajectory of what things are going to do, and you have a standard deviation about that, and you make some assumption of normality and have kind of a bell curve around that. But in this, in our approach, we're getting, um, <clears throat> we have, in, in this case, 30 distinct weather models that we're going to run, giving us 30 possible evolutions of the weather and renewable generation during the course of the day. So that's how we're handling uh, variability, and it's kind of a new approach. Here. Um, and as I mentioned, we're going to look at the cost effectiveness of storage in DR. And that, of course, depends upon what else in the system is operated uh, in terms of unit commitment, what, year, what units that you choose to turn off and on at the beginning of the day, and then the economic dispatch, the power levels that you assign to them in each five-minute interval. Okay, and if you have storage and DR, they would displace some of these conventional units and result in operating cost savings, and you want to estimate uh, what those savings are. And furthermore, we want to take our model and introduce more and more megawatts of storage and demand response in the system and essentially generate uh, this, it's sort of analogous to a demand curve for storage and DR. So on the x-axis, we have total megawatts of capacity that's been deployed in the system. And on the y-axis, we have the, the value or essentially the price in dollars per megawatt hour that should be offered to those resources. And, you know, as it's true in basically all economic systems, as you introduce more of the commodity in the market, its value is going to go down. Okay, so we want to generate uh, this essentially demand curve for storage and DR. Uh, okay, and then, uh, so the first question here, can um, gas generation and hydro uh, meet the needs for um, 
uh, regulation and load following under this highly, uh, under the 33% renewable portfolio standard. And the question is, do we need to build additional combustion turbines uh, to meet the needs in year 2020, or can we substitute storage and DR for those? And uh, as Chris mentioned, and we could schedule the ch uh, charging of plug-in electric vehicles. So if you look at uh, you know this daily min here, if you have a lot of office workers going in, they show up at nine in the morning, they don't leave till five, and they have their plug-in electric vehicles in the parking garage. I mean, that's, this is a perfect time to charge those and uh, smooth out those load, loads during the day. And then, of course, there's direct uh, control of uh, air conditioners, so I'm, I'm a participant in that, so PD&E can cut off my air conditioning. I think it's up to 12 times a year. And we want to put these resources in this overall production simulation model to look at the value of grid-scale storage in the context of operating, operating the system. Uh, and when we do that, we're going to look a little bit ahead to the year 2020 when we might have more sophisticated algorithms and bigger computers than we have now and look at stochastic optimization methods uh, that could be used to solve the unit commitment problem to schedule your units and the economic dispatch problems. And these stochastic uh, optimization methods can take, take into account this uncertainty better than just kind of contingency analysis or you know, engineering margins that are traditionally applied to, to deal with uncertainty. <clears throat> so here's kind of the overall flow of our analysis. And as I mentioned, there are principally three different types of models. The blue here is a, is a weather and renewable generator, uh, generator model that um, uh, processes the weather and passes to this yellow model here, which is the production simulation model. So we pass off these stochastic net loads at this point to this production simulation model here. Uh, and we modify demand response and storage capacity so we can put more and more uh, DR and storage megawatts into the system and kind of trace out points on that demand curve for DR and storage by going through this loop. And also periodically we're going to select days and uh, challenging hours out of the database here and check for system stability. Basically see if we have enough inertia in the system to have uh, to dampen out any um, oscillations that might be caused by failures of the system. Um, so just to <coughs> highlight, so there have been a, a lot of you know very good renewable integration studies that have been undertaken by, by Cal ISO and its collaborators and other institutions. Um, but we're, we're doing a few things that are new here that I just want to highlight. One is this idea of this ensemble weather forecast, the, that collection of trajectories that we're going to use to optimize the system rather than the point. It, it's new. People haven't done that before. Which feeds into this stochastic unit commitment uh, problem that we're going to solve, this difficult optimization problem. And then we're going to, for the first time, use this production simulation software that has multiple time scales. It solves this very difficult unit commitment problem with hourly time scales, and then it uh, goes down to five minute uh, time steps to solve the easier um, economic dispatch problem. Okay, so that's kind of the overall flow. Here. All right, so first let me go into the blue part of the model, which is the weather uh, trajectories and generating a collection of trajectories that we're going to optimize with respect to. Um, so we uh, use this code, the Weather Research and Forecasting Code, WARF code, that's um, sponsored by the National Center for Atmospheric Research, NCAR. It's an open source code that you know, many institutions have taken, so we took it and we've kind of optimized it for performance on high, compute, high performance computing systems. So it runs uh, very fast on our clusters. And basically, um, it just solves some uh, fluid dynamics equations, and not your Stokes differential equations. And it can um, you know, track the flow of air over the western US and give us wind speed, direction, stability class, and a number of uh, different other variables. And it can give us uh, surface solar insulation, and uh, temperature, which we use uh, to look at the impact on loads of different temperatures. And in fact, we use that to look at um, renewable generation from PV, since your efficiency of the PV changes with temperatures. So we solve um, all these equations, and we can get the, the weather over the western US and the western interconnect. 
And we do this at three different spatial scales. In this area, um, D1, for, for the western U.S., we have 27 kilometer grid scales, so they're fairly coarse, but we do get some representation of the atmosphere over the western U.S. And then we want, since we're focusing on California, in this regime D2, we neck down to nine uh, kilometer grid scale on the, this one. And then in these areas, D3 and D4, where we have a lot of renewable resources and most of the load in California, <clears throat> we model that at a three kilometer, pretty fine grid scale here. So we can get good estimates of what the renewable generation would be and, and what the loads are. And as I mentioned, we um, developed this ensemble forecast, which is a, just a collection of 30 different trajectories that we think um, in this case that the wind speed uh, might have over the course of a day. So this is the uh, ensemble prediction for a site that may be where a wind farm is so we can of course translate this in, into megawatts, wind speed into megawatts. And we get those 30 different um, weather trajectories by taking combinations of different um, physics submodels. Um, so there, there are basically uh, six types of physics submodels, uh, two that deal with the surface uh, boundary layer, two that deal with cloud formation, uh, and, and two that uh, deal with attenuation of uh, solar radiation. So we uh, populate these six classes of models into a WARF model, and then we can generate, we can you know, track the weather over um, over 24 hours and get one of these trajectories. Okay, speeding things up here. Um, so we take the weather model and we feed that into a production simulation model that's developed as oh, Plexos is a software, it's by Energy Exemplar. <clears throat> and we're using um, the Cal ISO's uh, model that they've used for all these uh, renewable integration studies. As you can see, it's a fairly aggregated in terms of you know, the transmission system. Uh, there are only 42 nodes in here for representation of the entire western U.S. And, we, and each one of those nodes, we aggregate the load um, and the renewable generation at that node and then just treat it as kind of one giant load center. And then we have transmission corridors that connect them that, that are capacity limited in terms of real megawatts. Um, it's, it has fairly uh, good resolution in terms of generators. We had 2,400 generators represented in there, uh, seven different types of renewables, and we have demand response. Okay, and as I mentioned, it's multi-time scale. Um, there's the sort of hourly unit commitment, five minute economic dispatch, and we're solving this difficult stochastic optimization problem. Um, I did have a movie in here, but we couldn't master the technology to get it to play here. But it's a pretty good way to visualize what's going on in the model. So um, if you're playing the model, maybe you can put it, on, uh, put it on the website or something eventually. But at each of the load centers here, we have a little pie diagram which shows the sources of power at each of those locations at that point in time. And the pie diagram expands and shrinks as you get more and more power or less power. The diameter is proportional to power. And then these are kind of all the contributions and then the, these arrows from one load center to the next get wider and narrow, narrower as the amount of flow uh, increases and decreases. Okay, as I mentioned before, that um, so we're going to you know do this analysis process, change these demand response and storage capacity, increase um, the quantity of megawatt storage here, and look at the value of it. And so you can given you know, our um, estimates of the net revenues, so our models only deal with variable costs, so we can give you net revenues for the year. Uh, one could look at that and do some NPV calculations to figure out, you know, how many megawatts of storage is, uh, you know, would make sense to deploy in California, so that, you know, that would justify the investments. Okay, and here's some data that we got from EPRI and the Energy Store, the California Energy Storage Alliance on the different um, storage technologies that we have in the, in the Plexus model. So we have kind of a short-term lithium-ion battery, one with a longer term, a flow battery, a flywheel that's <coughs> strictly used for regulation at kind of the four-second time scale, uh, compressed air energy storage uh, above ground, we have some parameters for below ground, 
which we understand they don't have any in, in California right now. So we have the megawatts, uh, the capital costs that you could use to make these NPV calculations to see if the adjustment, the investments are justified. Uh, plant life cycles that you can get out of the batteries at 80% depth of discharge. So some, some have proposed that, hey, what if we just do 5 or 10% depth of discharge and pay more capital costs for the battery, but you have extended battery life. And one of the, you know, kind of wild guesses we got from folks is that maybe you could increase this to 100,000 uh, cycles if you're only doing a shallow discharge. And then the round trip efficiency uh, for each of the battery types. And for the compressed air, we also have um, an effective heat rate that you have to use for when you're, when you're generating power. So there's the data sets. Uh, of course, we're not doing this alone. It takes a village. So we have on our team here, we have a subcontract with the California Institute for Energy and the Environment at UC Berkeley. And they're looking at uh, some of the assumptions we're making, helping us out with those. And for to do the um, sensitivity analysis, uh, we have a subcontract with Kima Corporation. Uh, they have um, some uh, software called Kermit that they use to look at the stability of the system. So given an economic dispatch and the configuration of units that are online, you know, is the system stable to perturbations? And then from the Demand Response Research Center at Lawrence Berkeley Labs, we've gotten some information on what types of, how much demand response capacity uh, would be available um, at different times of the day. We're using uh, Kaiso's uh, Plexos model of the system. I mentioned the WERF model that, that NCAR uh, we've had a, a long-standing um, research uh, relationship with uh, IBM. In fact, we have the largest computer system in the world now that's IBM's computer that's deployed at our site. Uh, but they also uh, market this CPLEX optimization engine that we're using to solve this difficult stochastic um, unit commitment problem. So we're doing with research with IBM to figure out how to get that to run faster. And this thing, this CPLEX thing, is at the core of many of these planning models uh, that we're using. So if we speed this up, there are, there are a lot of wins on a lot of dimensions. Energy Exemplar, Mark of the Plexos, and then uh, NREL. Um, so their system, uh, system analysis model. So to summarize, um, so we have some high fidelity models uh, that we're using to represent the weather, the renewable generation, um, and how that feeds into the, uh, your production simulation model. <coughs> we're solving this in stochastic mode and taking into account all these possible realizations of the weather and minimizing with respect to the entire ensemble, minimizing expected value. And then we're using this schema code for stability analysis. And ultimately we're going to generate uh, the value of storage is providing in the system in terms of net revenues as a function of how much we build. Uh, and that, of course that can, that's not the actual answer. The model involves many approximations and assumptions. So it's just to provide some uh, information points for policymakers to figure out uh, where to set these goals. Okay. And that concludes my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> if we have one or two very brief questions. My name is Chris Form. I understand Germany and Denmark has a lot of variable alternative energy. Have they done this model, or you are the first one? Um, we're, we're the first ones to build this um, ensemble weather forecasting model and couple it with a stochastic production simulation model and solve that optimization problem. Although, you know, we have done some work uh, for Siemens in, in the North Sea on some of their um, wind generation facilities, and we did this ensemble wind forecasting for them, but they did. We didn't couple it with the production simulation model. And this, uh, I mean, every 15 minutes uh, for each perturbation, will reconverge and uh, give a new solution. Is, is this what? So the, the weather model <coughs> generates um, well the data that we're going to use every 15 minutes. The, the underlying equations are solved at a much finer time scale. But um, we, don't, we don't trust the results at, at that time of time scale. So 15 minutes, we're getting the weather data out. And then we're interpolating to do the five-minute economic dispatch. Thank you. I think we're actually going to have to cut it off there for questions. Sorry not to be able to take more. But thank you once again for coming and speaking to us today. Thank you.